This program is going to be really interesting, so let's not waste time. Human beings have been wearing wigs for thousands of years, probably going back to the Stone Age. Queen Elizabeth I of England wore a wig. King Louis XIV of France wore a wig. But U.S. President George Washington did not wear a wig, despite what is commonly believed, although he sometimes used wig powder to tint his light brown hair a stylish white. Why do people wear wigs? Well, lots of reasons. Ceremony and ritual. To cover up thinning and graying hair as part of a costume or a disguise, although this bank robber's wig was not particularly successful on that score. And of course, wigs are worn for fashion. Although many people wear wigs today, there have been times in human history when wig wearing was something that just about everyone did, but not always for the reasons you learned about in school. So let's turn to art in the archeological record, beginning with one of the cultures known for wearing both elaborate wigs and headgear, ancient Egypt. Ancient Egyptian civilization lasted for an unprecedented 3,000 years, from King Narmer in 3100 BC at the beginning of the Bronze Age to Queen Cleopatra in the first century BC during Roman times. With such a long history, the use of wigs certainly changed over time, as did the styles of the wigs themselves. However, contrary to what is often believed, at no time in history did the ancient Egyptians shave their heads and wear wigs to protect themselves from the heat of the sun. No one who has ever worn a wig would make that assertion. Wigs are hot, heavy, and tend to be uncomfortable, especially in the heat, and Egypt is a very hot country. Many Egyptian sculptures and paintings do show people with shaved heads. These are priests who shave their heads as well as the rest of their bodies to achieve ritual purity, a concept I suspect also motivated the followers of Akhenaten, the father of King Tut, to shave their heads. But many other ancient Egyptians are portrayed with very short haircuts. For example, in the well-known Old Kingdom portraits of Prince Rahotep and his wife Nofret, Nofret seems to be wearing a wig, but Rahotep has a very short haircut, a style shown in other portrait sculptures from the same period. Let's turn to the hard evidence. We have many hundreds of Egyptian mummies, and the majority of them have hair. Men typically have short hair, and women have elaborate braids, dreadlocks, and sometimes even hair extensions. The most beautiful hair belongs to Queen T, the mother of Akhenaten and grandmother of King Tut. Here's how she may have looked in life. So when you read that all ancient Egyptians shaved their heads and wore wigs because that was somehow a cooler alternative to natural hair, do not believe it. The mummies themselves tell us otherwise, and most mummies have hair. However, ancient Egyptians did wear wigs. Obviously, there is more to this story. Here is another portrait of Rahotep, and this time he is apparently wearing a wig. Was it a fashion statement or something else? Quite a few wigs and hair pieces have been found in Egyptian tombs. They are made of human hair and are often decorated with gold beads and medallions. But here's something worth noting. Although they are often depicted in art, a wig in the short, curly style like the one Rahotep is wearing has never been found in a tomb or in any other location. In fact, are these people even wearing wigs at all, at least in the modern sense of the word? Scholars have suggested that these wigs may have been made of wool, horsehair, or even woven plant fibers. And they do indeed look like baskets, especially baskets woven from water hyacinth, a plant that grows along the Nile. Priests are often shown wearing this particular style of wig, but so are scribes, as well as members of the nobility and the royal family. Were these wigs perhaps ceremonial in nature, similar to the ones worn today in the British law courts? Did they indicate a person's rank or job or position in society? Were they actually more like helmets or hats than wigs? And what about the very exotic blue wigs that King Tut and his wife are wearing? Are they even real, or is this artistic license? King Tutankhamun's mummy has a bald head, suggesting that he may sometimes have worn a wig. But was it blue? Or could it be that the reason none of these distinctive short wigs have been found is because they did not exist? And what is being depicted, at least in some instances, is not a wig at all, but a representation of the subject's real hair.
may be augmented with beads. I'm just throwing this out here. But when you compare the ancient hairdos with those of modern people with a similar ethnicity, it seems plausible, at least until an actual wig matching the description turns up. Wigs and hair pieces continued to be worn in ancient Rome and during the Middle Ages. But let's skip ahead to the 17th and 18th centuries, another time period in which wigs became very, very fashionable. To anyone familiar with American and British history, the red-coated, white-wigged British officer is very familiar. And despite what you may have heard, like their ancient Egyptian counterparts, men in the 17th and 18th centuries did not shave their heads in order to wear wigs. However, baldness was much more common in both men and women than it is today. Bald-headed people who wore wigs were often lampooned in political cartoons, but it was no laughing matter. These men and women had lost their hair, not just from natural aging, but from illness, dangerous medications containing poisons such as arsenic and mercury, and beauty products made from, believe it or not, lead. Lead causes hair loss. Wig wearing became fashionable during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. Elizabeth was a style icon, much admired for her wavy red hair and pale complexion, and many women copied her style. But she caught smallpox that left her face slightly scarred and perhaps caused thinning hair. In order to retain her beauty and the appearance of vigorous youth and health, Elizabeth began wearing a wig and painting her face with a popular cosmetic known as ceruse. Ceruse is powdered lead, it's the same ingredient that was used in lead-based paint until it was outlawed in the 1970s. In Elizabeth's time, Ceruse makeup was used to achieve the very light complexion that was so much admired during the Renaissance and well into the 17th and 18th centuries. And despite common knowledge that it was dangerous, Ceruse makeup continued to be used all during that time. If you paint lead on your face, it causes gray, dry, wrinkled skin, something Elizabeth tried to mask by applying a thick overglaze of egg white. How these late portraits got past the censors is a mystery, but note her gray complexion and cadaverous face. Many people died of lead poisoning caused by makeup. As was observed at the time, they died for beauty. So what did people look like wearing all those wigs and lead-based makeup? Maybe not exactly like mine, Marcel Mousseau. More like these actors playing Elizabeth. Not all that beautiful. And now for King Louis XIV of France, one of the most famous wig wearers of all time. Like Elizabeth, Louis once had beautiful hair, but in his 20s his hair began to thin. No illness here, no lead makeup. He simply came from a family with male pattern baldness. So Louis began wearing fantastic wigs made of the finest human hair. Called full-bottomed wigs, they caught on among men of power, money, and influence, who became known as big wigs, a term we still use. The wigs worn by judges and in the British House of Lords date back to this era. King Charles II of England, a contemporary of Louis XIV, was also an enthusiastic wearer of the full-bottomed wig. Interestingly, all throughout the 17th century and for most of the 18th century, it was only men who wore big wigs or wigs at all. Women wore their natural hair, which they sometimes powdered or augmented with a few hair extensions and curls. That's all. Now before you laugh at these gentlemen for their big hair, consider the styles of the so-called hair bands of the 1980s. Exactly the same. The most famous mistress of King Louis XV, Madame de Pompadour, never wore her hair in the style known as the Pompadour, which was named after her during the 20th century by people who obviously did no research. Women did not begin wearing extravagant hairstyles until the reign of Louis XVI and his queen Marie Antoinette, which was in the late 1700s. This is the era of the ridiculously high hairstyles, feathers, and wig powder that we often think characterized the entire 18th century. In reality, however, except in cartoons, at the Carnival of Venice, and of course at the French court, styles were far less extreme. And most women continued to wear their own hair, although padded and piled high with the help of numerous hair pieces. But when you compare them, you can see that these styles are actually no more extreme than the beehives and the big hair styles of the 1960s and the 1980s. During the American Revolution of 1776, 
Although leaders such as Thomas Jefferson wore wigs before the conflict began, wigs and extravagant clothes began to be regarded as symbols of repressive colonial rule and were thus replaced with natural hair and a more sober American style of dress, putting an end to the powdered wig craze, at least in America. A decade later, the same thing happened in France during the French Revolution, only with more dire consequences for the aristocracy, some of whom wore their wigs to the very end. For the 10-Minute Professor, this is Dr. Susan Ray Euler. Thanks for tuning in.